I can, I'm good? Hello, welcome to the Commonwealth Club, the nation's oldest and largest political affairs forum. I'm Rabbi Daniel Stein. I'll be your moderator this evening for today's live and online panel, Ukraine Patriotism, Putin's Brutality, and World Empathy. A reminder to those online who send your questions to chat to please send your questions to chat for the Q&A period following our presentations. And for those in the audience, please use the question cards provided. Now, uh, it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, Celia Menschel. Celia is the volunteer chair of the Commonwealth Club's member-led Middle East Forum, a position she's enjoyed for many years. Please welcome Celia Menschel. Thank you. I'm wearing the mask because I'm immunocompromised. But I can take it down for a minute if you don't mind. No, I'm good. Thanks, Rabbi. I got the idea for this program. Uh, when you uh, told me at synagogue that you were going to Krakow, Poland, to help um, refugees and um, to the community Jewish, it was, I'll do that again, the Krakow Jewish Community Center, which works with Ukrainian refugees especially. I also got the idea from the bar mit mitzvah when the young man quote, quoted Leviticus about leaving the fields, the edges of the fields open for the poor and um, it reminded me of what uh, the world is doing to help Ukraine. But in World War II there was no haven for refugees, especially from the Ukraine. Over a million and a half died and thank God the world is accepting millions of refugees and God willing, I hope you will forgive me saying, God willing, that uh, there will be peace soon. And I also wanted to say that whatever I say today is entirely my own opinion. I'm sitting here not representing the club in any way, though I've volunteered here for a number of years. And I'm going to show a, a video in just a second, but I, I did want to mention one more thing. I was also going to talk about a book by Putin called First Person, and it really wasn't a book by Putin. He had a series of interviews in 2000, yeah, the year 2000, and a, a pre-publication book came into my hands 15 years later, but um, as far as I know, and nobody has read this book, so I highly recommend it. You will learn a lot about Putin. He okayed it, he donated the pictures for it, um, they're very interesting photographs, and I think you understand, or can understand, a little bit better about what drives people like him to do the terrible things he does. Um, I'd also like to mention that my family's from the Ukraine, actually from a place called Nadverna, and I got this information from the Ukrainian Institute of, um, well, Ukrainian Institute in D.C., um, it says Nadvorna, where my family came from, is a city located in the oblast in western Ukraine, but it was Austro-Hungary. It was also something else. So over time in World War I, it, and now even, things are changing very rapidly. And I just, um, I'm very moved by the situation. And now I would like to show a video I'm so proud of President Zelensky, this was done yesterday, um, and I, it's only five minutes long. Thank you. Great people of Great Ukraine, on August 24, 2021, the whole country celebrated the 30th anniversary of our independence. Our soldiers, our defenders, our equipment were moving along the Shatik. Our Maria was flying in the sky. There is nothing more dangerous than an insidious enemy, but there is nothing more 
poisonous and a saint friend. These are the words of a great Ukrainian philosopher, Grigory Skolorada. On February 24th, we realized this truth when a faint friend started a war against Ukraine. This is not a war of two armies, this is a war of two worldviews. The war waged by barbarians who shelled the Skovorada Museum and believe that their missiles can destroy our philosophy. It annoys them, it is unfamiliar to them, it scares them. Its essence is that we are free people who have their own past. Today we are waging war on this past and we will not give anyone a single piece of our land. Today we celebrate the day of victory over Nazism and we will not give anyone a single piece of our history. We are proud of our ancestors who, together with other nations in the anti-Hitler coalition, defeated Nazism. And we will not allow anyone to annex this victory, we will not allow it to be appropriated. Our enemy dreamed that we would refuse to celebrate May the 9th and the victory over Nazism, so that the word denazification gets a chance. Millions of Ukrainians fought Nazism and went through a difficult and known journey. The Nazis were expelled from Luhansk, the Nazis were expelled from Donetsk and Kherson and Melitopol and Berdyansk were liberated from the occupiers. The Nazis were expelled from Yalta, Simferopol, Kerch and the entire Crimea. Mariupol was liberated from the Nazis. They expelled the Nazis from all over Ukraine. But the cities I named are especially inspiring us today. They give us faith that we will drive the occupiers out of our own land for sure. On the day of victory over Nazism, we are fighting for a new victory. The road to it is difficult, but we have no doubt that we will win. What is our advantage over the enemy? We are smarter by one book. That is a textbook on the history of Ukraine. We would not grieve, all our enemies could read and draw the right conclusions. On February the 24th, Russia launched an offensive, treading on the same rake. Every occupier who comes to our land treads on it. We have been through different wars, but they all had the same final. Our land was sown with bullets and shells, but no enemy was able to take root here. Enemy chariots and tanks drove through our fields, but it did not bear fruit. Enemy arrows and missiles flew in our skies, but no one will be able to overshadow our blue sky. There are no shackles that can bind our free spirit. There is no occupier who can take root in our free land. There is no invader who can rule over our free people. Sooner or later we win. Despite the horde, despite Nazism, despite the mixture of the first and the second, which is the current enemy, we win, because this is our land, because someone is fighting for the father Tsar and the Führer, the party and the chief, and we are fighting for our homeland. We have never fought against anyone, we always fight for ourselves, for our freedom, for our independence, so that the victory of our ancestors was not in vain. They fought for freedom for us and won. We are fighting for freedom for our children, and therefore we will win. We will never forget what our ancestors did in World War II, where more than 8 million Ukrainians died. Every fifth Ukrainian didn't return home. In total, the war claimed at least 50 million lives. We do not say we can repeat because only a madman can wish to repeat the 2194 days of war. The one who is repeating the horrific crimes of Hitler's regime today, following Nazi philosophy, copying everything they did, he is doomed, because he was cursed by millions of ancestors when he began to imitate their killer. And therefore, he will lose everything, and very soon there will be two victory days in Ukraine, and someone will not have even one left. We won then, we will win now too, Ukraine. Congratulations on the victory day of Nazism, glory to Ukraine. I should mention that this film was done by Ukrainian TV, and it was done <laughs> yesterday. So I, I want to thank Celia both for um, 
with her, her passion for this topic and for convening uh, today's dialogue. So thank you, and thank you for bringing that video uh, to us. As Celia mentioned, uh, I'm Rabbi Daniel Stein. I'm the rabbi at Congregation B'nai Shalom in Walnut Creek. Uh, and as she shared, uh, Margalit and I recently returned from um, a humanitarian mission to uh, Krakow, Poland, to the Krakow Jewish Community Center to observe uh, their refugee work. And, and what I want to share before I introduce Margalit is that um, our perspective here is probably similar to many of you who are here with us today in person and online, that is, as concerned community members, people with a strong interest in human rights, uh, but not necessarily as experts per se. So I think our goal today is to share our perspective as people who, who've returned from Eastern Europe and uh, who were witnesses to, uh, as I think Marguerite will share, one of the great humanitarian challenges of our time. So it's, it's my honor uh, to introduce Margalit Ear. Margalit is the co-chair of Congregation B'nai Shalom's Tikkun Olam Committee, uh, the committee at our congregation that works on issues of um, social import. We recently traveled together to Krakow, Poland, to observe relief efforts for, for Ukrainian refugees. Uh, I'd like to welcome Margalit Ear. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you, Celia, for having me here today, and hello, everyone. Um, just a little bit of a background for you to give you perspective um, where my passion is coming from. My, I am a daughter of Holocaust survivors in the Soviet Union. My father was imprisoned and sent to the gulag in Siberia to chop down trees 12, 14 hours a day. My mother, pregnant with my sister and my 10-month-old brother, had to run away from Bel in Belarus and ended up being at the very southern tip of Afghanistan and um, Russia, on the old map, if you will, in a place where she lost the two children. Over the course of eight years trying to survive the war and find a refuge, my parents went through a dozen countries, crossed all of these borders, clandestinely tried to get into Israel, were caught by the British, taken to, to Cyprus, and eventually entered Israel two days before partition. And of course, right into another war. Well, my, brother, my younger brother was born, my, I was born, my older brother was born in Cyprus. The, this is not a new family for my parents. And we came to the United States in 1960. Many people helped us. Clothing, food, dress, you know, um, furniture, jobs, anything. When I was 23, I was widowed with a two-year-old child. Many people helped me. And I'm sure all those people who helped me had those in the background that helped as well, but I will probably never know who they are. So I thank them forever. And this is where my passion is, pay forward to help those who are struggling, especially in war. And I'm honored to say that my daughter and my two grandsons are doing so in the East Coast. So when the rabbi asked me to join on this mission, it was an, an instinctive yes. I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. And that was Wednesday afternoon and Saturday, I was already taxiing out of SFO into Krakow and walked into the JCC and I was just amazed at what I saw at the Jewish Community Center. There's a very big sign in, that says in Ukrainian, welcome. And when I entered the premises or the campus on the right-hand side, there were men, the women and children who were queued up to come in to get whatever food and clothing that they needed, any support that they needed from housing to education to psychological help. On the left-hand side were strollers that were donated by the Polish citizens of Krakow and pallets and pallets of food that was donated by a number of people. It was like a telepathic message that went on to, out to the Polish people. We need your help. And they brought everything that you can imagine to make the transition for the refugees just a little bit smoother. I uh, worked 
on Monday afternoon, I worked at the JCC trying to keep the, pl the uh, tables full of food. And every, I don't know, every 10 minutes, they brought in another 10 people, uh, mothers and children, and couldn't get a smile from them, couldn't see any happiness in the children. It was really trauma written all over them. And as a Jewish mother, it was a, my absolute honor and my job in life was to literally hand uh, food for someone, to someone. The next day we went um, to one of the eight crossings that um, is on the Ukrainian, the Polish-Ukrainian border, Medica. It's one of the larger one. And as I'm walking towards the border gate, there is this, I just want you to envision this wide uh, walkway. Well, it has been dubbed the boulevard, where women, elderly p uh, women, and children, babies, and animals are crossing back and forth. And I didn't understand the reason for the back and forth. And then I was told that there are those women who are coming from the Ukraine into Poland, and then there are those who are coming, returning from Poland back to Ukraine because they wanted to be with their husbands and fathers and brothers. And that was very heartbreaking. And then there was a third group. And the third group was the people on the Ukraine side who haven't eaten in days, who were able to cross into Poland to get a hot meal because along each side of the boulevard were tents tents from various NGOs who were providing food, um, SIM cards for telephones, um, directions, there was um, medical care, and so on. It was an incredible sight, an incredible sight. From um, Medica, we were taken to um, Peshmezhul. I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly. Uh, this is where the registration center is. The, the refugees are taken there. They're given an opportunity to register. They have, this is a temporary location. Think in terms of, it's called Tetsco, which is their supermarket like, like our Costco, but they had an, an inside the facility were storefronts, and each of those storefronts were now repurposed for some service organization that was going to provide some help. Everything was vetted. It was interesting to see that um, there were a couple of uh, storefronts that had country flags hanging, one for Germany, one for Spain, one for uh, Sweden. It didn't make a difference, but this is an opportunity. This provided the refugees an opportunity to go to each of those countries storefront, read and see what the country was offering the refugees. And if they found a commonality with the, ref with the country, then that country would transport them to that, their country free of charge. So Prishmishal and the um, registration um, is a, a one day, you register, you rest, you get a cot, you sleep in the open with everybody else. It accommodates a thousand people a day. This one day, we were there were approximately six hundred. The animals were roaming, the the kids were scooting around. It was a uh, an organized chaos, to say the least. And um, I, I want to go back to the JCC Krakow. When the war broke out in February twenty four. JCC Krakow didn't have any experience in, in uh, relocating refugees. So they approached the uh, executive director, who is uh, Jonathan Ornstein, and they said, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we need help. And he says, of course. And his staff was just scringing because they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the, the services. They didn't have anything lined up. They didn't know what to do and how to do it. And... Um, the word no for Jonathan doesn't exist. He's an incredibly dynamic man, and he began to call every single contact that he has worldwide. And he said, I need 
and they sent, and they sent millions of dollars. He offers, he found um, space that was repurposed. As an example, there was a little, uh, little warehouse space behind a fashion designer's front store, and she wasn't using it. That was repurposed for a um, preschool, a safe environment for the children. Uh, the uh, hotels were provided uh, for these, for the refugees, excuse me, and uh, they can stay for as long as they want. The idea, of course, is to get them moved over to Germany or Western Europe. Um, the resources are pretty sparse in Poland, but Poland provides them with 100% medica medical care, uh, education, psychological care, housing. Thank you, Margalit. I hope that kind of covers it. So I, I want to thank Margalit for her comments. And uh, we're going to have a period of question and answer and also hopefully a dialogue. So now it's time for questions and answers. Uh, a reminder to those online to please send your questions uh, for the panel to chat. Please note this is a Commonwealth Club virtual program called Ukraine Patriotism, Putin's Brutality, and World Empathy. Our speakers today are Margalit Ear and Celia Menchel. I'm Rabbi Daniel Stein of Congregation Bay Shalom in Walnut Creek. Uh, so, Margalit, I want to turn back to um, one of the one of the issues that you raised, which is the vast majority of refugees coming across the border, at least that we we witnessed and saw, but we've also read in press reports. Uh, I think the number is that 95 percent of the refugees, or 90 percent of the refugees are uh, women and children. A very small number of the refugees are men over the age of 65 who are able to, um, to leave Ukraine. And I was wondering if there's anything in your experience that spoke specifically to the experiences of women uh, that stood out to you, or if there were specific concerns that uh, women refugees might be facing as part of, um, as part of their challenges. So the first challenge the um, women, thank you, Rabbi, the first challenge the women were um, facing, um, you know, the world is wonderful, and the world got together and, and offered tens, hundreds, billions of dollars. On the flip side, there is the sad part of humanity, and that is human trafficking, and that became a real problem um, at the crossings. And so they put together some sort of program to um, vet the uh, volunteers who came in and offered to drive the refugees to anywhere they wanted to go to in Western Europe. Um, the women, you know, they're traumatized. Many of them, the bulk of them, are university educated or have high level technical degrees. So they are skilled middle-class women, uh, but they have children who are traumatized, and this is something they need to work with. And um, some have about 30,000 of the nearly 3 million who, ha who landed in Poland have found full-time positions, and that really is very little. It's very difficult. There's language difficulties. So the women now have to find homes. They have to settle their children down and, and work with, with their children. And, they, and there's no one for them to help them uh, psychologically get over the trauma, if one can ever get over the trauma. I mean, their minds are always back at home. What happened to my husband, my son, my child? So that, that's a, a, a terrible position to put a woman in who's trying to move her life forward with her children. Um, hello. Sorry. Um, there was something. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to say it, but I think yesterday and the day before in Afghanistan, the Taliban have renewed, um, um, I don't know, the, the bad treatment of women, I call it, and I could be wrong, but, and also all over the world, in Syria, in Africa, in Rwanda, et cetera, and so forth, um, there's difficulties, and I, but we seem to have forgotten Afghanistan. We seem to have forgotten the other places of the world. 
I just hope this won't happen now, and I didn't want to forget to say that. Mm. Um, a question here uh, asks about, um, at least from our experience, what are the most, um, and I may have a comment on this as well, but wh what are the most pressing issues um, facing refugees? That is, what, what do um, the refugees need from those of us uh, abroad? You know, the, uh, the list is long, so we won't touch the political side of it. Um, housing in Poland is very difficult for the Polish citizens. Uh, it's making it even more difficult with the nearly three million who have just arrived. Now this is on top of the one and a half million uh, who were legally, who have legally arrived in uh, Poland from the Ukraine prior to the war, and they were working in construction and agriculture and they were sending money back. So you have four and a half million Ukrainian people in uh, a country that is not equipped to um, handle it, uh, both um, from a, an infrastructure point of view, an education point of view, or housing. Um, the need is immense, and I think right now what we can do is raise more funds to make it a little bit easier for them. And I, I, I would agree with that, and I would, I would just add that what, what I observed um, the older generation of, um, of Poles obviously speaks Russian, um, but the younger generation of Poles doesn't. Most, most of the younger generation of Poles speak Polish. And uh, what Margot Lee uh, pointed to, that the challenge that these refugees are facing is in many ways administrative, I think is, is really true. So people come into uh, these refugee resettlement depots, uh, people come into train stations in major cities in Warsaw and Krakow, um, and they have to figure out, am I going to stay um, in Poland? Am I going to try to make my way uh, to a point um, further west in the European Union? And for many of them, they're navigating a bureaucracy either in English or in Polish that isn't intuitive to them. And I think that there's probably a need for people who, in terms of you know, volunteer support, and this is a question I'll ask Mark Leet, in terms of volunteer support, there's so much that people like us can do and I think there's a great need for people who have other kinds of um, skills. So there's a question to that point here, uh, Margalee, and I'll, I'll ask it in two ways. So the question is, um, if the opportunity presented itself, would you return for similar kinds of work? And I might, I might phrase the question differently, which is that um, I know in the day, we, we had a rather spontaneous invitation to, uh, <laughs> to join a group of rabbis and concerned individuals helping this Krakow Jewish Community Center. Um, and at least for me, there was a kind of moral question that I struggled with, which is, um, why should I go? Um, can I, is there anything I can do as an American rabbi in the Bay Area that's really going to, to help? Um, and am I going to be diverting resources away at a time when my presence is going to be less than helpful? And that's something I grappled with. Um, and so I guess the question is, would you do something like this again? And also, what, could, what did you learn from being present that you couldn't learn from YouTube or the New York Times? What was, what was your experience in that regard? <sighs> Loaded question, Rabbi. <laughs> um, what did I learn? Would I do it again? On a dime, the moment that you gave me the invitation, it was an instinctive yes. I didn't even have a chance to speak with my husband who's here in the audience. And when I second guessed myself, he says, my God, you've got to go, you've got to go, you've got to go, this is what you've been wanting to. And he was right. And I asked him to join me many, many times. And he says, no, this is yours. And so um, I went and I, I don't know that even today, which is a month later, that I actually wrapped my head around what everything that was going on there and everything that I witnessed. Um, would I go? I would go back if I had an ability to spend some substantial time and help. And I don't know in what capacity but it would make me feel as though I've made a, a change in someone's life. Now, as a co-chair of Tikkun Olam, you know, when the war broke out, we raised an incredible amount of money at, in our synagogue to send over. 
And then post our trip to Poland, we raised an equal amount of that incredible amount um, to send. And, and, and that's wonderful because they need the money and they, need, they know what to do with it and they, they can purchase the, need, the things that they actually need rather than those are items that we think they need and we send over. Um, no, Rabbi, it was not a waste of time or you didn't take resources away from anything else. It was to bear witness uh, to something as tragic as is happening in 2022. Um, is, an, is, is a responsibility that we have. I feel that I have that responsibility. Someone helped my mother and someone helped me. And it's our turn to help because that's the only way we can move forward. I, and I, I think I would, I would agree with, with that, that, that for me, um, that power of witnessing was something very, very profound that I, I have the capacity to imagine, but I until I really was present, I don't think I understood. So I think we hear, we hear numbers uh, in terms of what the refugee crisis really is. Um, when we were there, there had been 700,000 uh, Ukrainians who had come into uh, Poland. As Marguerite said today, the number is it's over 2 million, approaching 3 million. Um, but nothing really prepares you um, for being in a train station and seeing one mother and one daughter and one teddy bear and um, one carry-on bag and understanding that this is this person's life today and it gives you a clear sense i think for me of um of the world's responsibility uh, celia please yes um i wanted to say that my mom was a holocaust survivor and i have her suitcase that she carried um when she left vienna actually well to cut it short she was in vienna in 1939 and it's about that big it's cardboard everything she had was in it and she was rescued by, I, she said, righteous Christians, righteous mm -hmm. Gentiles. And maybe it's possible Sugihira, I don't know if people know of mm -hmm. him. He was a Japanese consul in Vienna and he helped people get out. And my mom got to England and I was born in the basement of St. Giles Hospital in London in June 15th, 1940 and I remember even though I was just a baby, you know, very young, I remember the blitz and what my mom said. And the other thing about the Jews in many, many, many countries, and pardon me, this is personal, couldn't get out, there was no haven. But um, Tikkun Olam, which um, Marguerite uh, chairs, means repair the world. And there's always hope when there's repair the world. Mm. Thank I you. I would like to share an experience that our mission um, had um, on our way to Medica on Tuesday we were told that uh, we would be um, meeting an elderly couple who lived on the east side of Ukraine in the Donetsk area and that we would be bringing them from the border into Krakow and that was the most an incredible incredible day that we've had. In addition to witnessing what was happening on the border, we spent three hours with Anatoly and Irina. Um, they were finally convinced that they needed to evacuate and they trained to Lviv and from Lviv their son arranged uh, a volunteer to take them to the Medica uh, border. And at the border, some other volunteer had walked them across the border into the World Central Kitchen tent where we were waiting. Uh, well, they were waiting for us. And when we finished our trip and we were on our way back to, um, to Krakow, he was telling us this story. They lived for five, six weeks with bombing and shelling five hours a day, they had to run down to their cellar, which was not really equipped. It was damp, it was windowless, there was nothing there. Um, and this was for five, six weeks till they finally agreed that they needed to come across. 
And um, it was interesting because we, ha we were very fortunate to have a rabbi who actually was born in um, Kiev, and so she spoke Russian and Ukrainian very fluently, and she served as our interpreter. And um, I asked her, does he know that we are six rabbis and three lay people? And Anatoly and Irina were not Jewish. And, but he is also a, a specialist in bees and, the pol and studies the pollination of bees. And, and so she says, well, you know, we're all Jewish rabbis and uh, we practice different levels of Judaism. And he says, ah, yes, it's like the bees. There's a whole variety of bees and everyone has a part in the world. So this is wonderful and was the most incredible experience was to watch as the rabbis blessed Irina and Anatoly as we left them at the hotel in Krakow, and they blessed us for the w work we were doing. Doesn't get better than that. I, I think actually, so that, that brings up another really interesting issue um, about what we saw in Krakow. And I think people are aware that the, um, the political environment of, uh, of Eastern Europe is, is dynamic and there's a uh, I think a, a very strong nationalistic tendency among certain groups in Eastern Europe. Um, and there's also uh, a very strong movement towards open society and towards liberalism. And those divides are very strong. So one of the things that we saw in Krakow um, is that there had been this whole organization of interfaith activists, of uh, Catholics, Muslims, and Jews, who actually were starting to work together to um, welcome the expected wave of refugees from Belarus that never came, right? So when the, um, when the, um, when the, uh, the, the refugees were sort of massed at the border in Belarus, this sort of liberal interfaith community of Krakow came together to make room for the, um, the Muslim refugees and developed a kind of infrastructure for refugee resettlement. Um, and, and to the disappointment of that community, those refugees weren't allowed in. Uh, so that when this crisis of Ukrainian refugees happened, there was an existing network that was eager to receive them. But there's also a sense, I think, among people in Poland, um, the, the Poles that we encountered who were engaged in this work were very clear to ask, why are these refugees different than the other refugees? And so while, um, while Poland deserves a great deal of credit for what's happening today in terms of their Herculean efforts to resettle these Ukrainian refugees, I think there are also animate issues still going on in, um, in Poland today. But I think, for me, I was very inspired that the bulk of this refugee work, resettlement work, is being done by interfaith partners of goodwill is something I found deeply um, moving. Um, I, have a, I have a question here. Um, a Ukrainian friend says her sister, niece, and nephew um, will not join her in San Francisco, even though she would pay for everything. She wants to go home to Ukraine. Do you think this will change? I, I, I'm going to say just one word about this, and I'll call on Celia, who has something I think she'd like to share. Um, and uh, Marguerite maybe will want to speak this too. There's. Human beings are prideful. And I think we saw from the video that, that Celia shared, and I think we've witnessed that the Ukrainian people are deeply resolute. Um, and there's a matter of, of shame in a certain sense in being a refugee that some people even encounter, right? That they're leaving something behind. I think if you ask the couple that we met, they would say they were going home. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, they would say they were, they were going home. If you watch the news as we all watch, there, there may not be a home uh, to go back to for many of these people. I think, again, this is, not as, this is not as an expert in any capacity. This is just, I think the scale of what we witnessed was so remarkable. Um, I think that this is going to be a crisis that's going to be living in Europe for many years, and ultimately is going to be, uh, depending on how we ad adapt to refugee resettlement here in, in America, I think it'll also be something that we'll be, um, we'll be managing. So 
do you, do you think that this will change? I, I think as long as uh, there's the level of brutality that we're seeing, especially in the east of Ukraine, I think it's going to be a long road. Uh, Celia. Okay, so my belief, God willing, is that Ukraine survives intact, hopefully. I don't mean the buildings, I mean spiritually, because what I've read, what I've seen, I love The Economist, I love The New Yorker, all the, I have a couple of the magazines at the back if you want to see them. There's just so many beautiful articles about people wanting to go home to Ukraine. They'll rebuild it, I believe. I mean, I don't think, I, I don't know, I just got the impression that ah, they want to be home. Un, un, yeah, with, uh, without a doubt. I think it's their spirit, their spirit of nationalism, um, pride in their country that is going to take them and keep them at home. The, you know, the uh, women and, and children who uh, left, I mean, they left for the safety. Um, they left elderly parents, they left family members, they left husbands and wives, uh, husbands and, and um, sons. Um, and they want to go to their place, their home. This is their home, yes. I can understand a woman not wanting to come to the United States, even though it's wonderful here, you know? Yeah. Let, let me ask you, Marguerite, um, what, what do you think surprised you um, the most in your time in, uh, in Poland? Uh, I thought about this question um, for a number of days. And I think it comes down to this. This was a situation in Poland, whether you're from the JCC or uh, another NGO organization or you're the government of Poland. There was um, no sitting around the fancy executive office and trying to plan and strategize and create a budget and then review and review and delete and add and take away and whatever we do in corporate America um, to make this happen. This was a situation that just overnight tens of thousands of people came and they needed to be cared for. And it was really at the seat of the pants that these organizations put something together. And even today, 100 and I think 93 days into the war, and there still isn't a real solid, solid written program. They're writing it as things occur. So for instance, if I may another moment, the human trafficking, that it didn't even come into question when the war first broke out and people started to come across. We were given a story of a woman who came with her child and was picked up by a Polish driver. And then as soon as she got into the car and he started to drive off, she had a total, total meltdown. She was screaming, carrying on, and he didn't know what to do. He stopped the car and she ran out. And so he called the police because he was scared for her. It was after that he was interrogated by the police that um, they had to actually send some drones to find her, and they found her huddled. And when she calmed down, she said it was she, she was warned about human trafficking. And uh, she didn't know this person who offered to give her a ride anywhere in Western Europe. So this is a big problem. So, you know, it, it's they're learning to create uh, help to to provide help as help is needed, and um, that was the the awesome thing is that they just did it. There was never a question of no. It was never a word no. Everything can be done, and it's being done. So my, I I guess the the questions are going to start drawing us towards a conclusion, or maybe something that we've alluded to, but maybe we, we want to address more explicitly. Um, which is that I think for those of us in, um, in the Jewish community, um, 
perhaps naively, at least for me as a rabbi, I'll, I'll speak in the first person, for me as a rabbi and a leader in the Jewish community, I was surprised, as I said, perhaps naively, by the depth of response within our community um, to this issue. And uh, of course, I probably shouldn't have been. I think most American Jews, the majority of American Jews, have roots in, in this part of the world. And to see a refugee crisis across Europe brings up many um, deeply held memories within the context of our community that calls us um, to action. But there are other things I think that have been surprising in that regard. So Poland is a country that I think is 95% um, Catholic. And the other 5% is mostly uh, Ukraine. Pri 95 <laughs> Before February, let's say. Before February, Poland is 90, was 95% Catholic. And the other 5% was largely Ukrainian guest workers in the country. Jews in Poland today, the town of Krakow where we were, there are um, officially less than 200 Jews and unofficially 800 Jews. Um, and so a, a question that comes up to me is, what do we think is, is motivating this mass response of the Jewish community in a way that um, is making such an impactful change? It looks like Celia wants to speak uh, oh, to that question. Yes, <laughs> because it strikes me just like in Leviticus is a really tough chapter, but it said it in Leviticus. I mean, and, it, and if you look at the Ten Commandments, Rabbi, am I off base? They tell us to love our neighbor. We are told to welcome the stranger, be kind. And if I may add now, Israel's taken in, I think, about 20,000 Ukraines, irregardless of faith. And all over the world, I think, almost everywhere is, is or are, ex uh, most countries are accepting them readily. But still, if you're asking about Judaism, and my father's a Christian, <laughs> so and I sit on uh, the elected council of the Contra Costa Interfaith Council, so I've had the most wonderful opportunity to meet people of all faiths, and we're all the same, and I, I, I think, and I don't know, Rabbi. I just think, did I misunderstand? No, no, question? that's it. it and yeah. I'd, I'd love for Glee also if you'd like to speak to that question. I, and I'd like to answer that very personally. Um, there are 20, more than 27,000 righteous among the nations that are listed in Yad Vashem. The Christians, the Gentiles who helped Jewish families hide them and, and care for them and feed them and, and whatever was needed and put their own lives at jeopardy. And I believe honestly there must be hundreds of thousands more that haven't had um, the on honor of being named because everybody perished or they didn't meet the criteria for some reason. And I look at that number and I know that that number, someone there helped my mother. My father-in-law is from Ukraine, was from Ukraine. Um, we need to look at the goodness of people and, and, and we need to move, if I feel I need to move forward and I can't do that if I am sitting in the back 80 years ago. I can name 59 people in my most immediate family by name who had perished in the Holocaust and many, many more who I don't know their names. But I can't sit and dwell on that all the time. We have to move our society forward. And so, um, yeah. It's important. So, yep. Forgive me. My mother um, wouldn't teach me German, but I can sprechen a little, because uh, I listened to my grandmother and my mother speaking, oh, um, Polish and German and Czech and all the rest of it. That my mother spoke eight languages, though she wasn't well educated. But she told me always, from the minute I can remember, never forget we must forgive. And when she was uh, younger than me, because I'm 82 in two weeks, my <laughs> mother went to um, Vienna when she was in almost 80. And she said, I'm going to all the countries where Jews were mistreated and go only to art museums, because art is the most important thing in the world. If you look at the art, it will help you find solitude or whatever. But I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> 
And and I'll offer just maybe one one thought in this regard as well. I think if you were to, oh that yes, the, thank you. Um, okay, and I'll I'll share a comment, and then this will be our our last question. Um, I think if you were to talk with, um, if you are, we may have time for one more after this. So if, if anyone else has what has, they can bring up. Um, yeah. So if um, if you were to um, speak to most American. Jews, they would have in their families uh, stories like the stories Celia shared, and stories like the stories that Marguerite shared, and, and, and I have one as well, which which I'll I'll share just for uh, a second, which is that we went to this um, this border crossing in um, in Medica, and part of the reason that Krakow is attracting uh, so many refugees, it's the closest major um, rail station to the Ukrainian border, um, but. Medica, where we went, is, is right up on the border. And people may have some knowledge of history that that part of Ukraine around uh, Lviv or, or Lemberg um, was, it, it's called Western Ukraine, and it wasn't always part of um, Ukraine. And that happens to be part of Ukraine where my own family uh, was from. My family was not a family of Holocaust survivors. They came to the United States during the wave of immigration from 1880 to 1920. My grandmother came through uh, Ellis Island in 1925, but she was born um, in 1914, and her earliest memory um, was uh, was hiding during a during a pogrom in in Ukraine. And I, I had this just overpowering emotion as we went to this part of Ukraine. We were 30 miles from where my grandmother uh, was born, and I think there are two ways that individuals and communities can respond to trauma. You can respond uh, to trauma by uh, becoming defensive, right? You can have an impulse to say, I'm going to look out for myself and protect what's mine. And I think that the lesson that many Jews, not all, many Jews have learned from our experiences is maybe the opposite, to say, you know, because people weren't there for us, um, we have a responsibility to be there for other people and to ensure the fair and just and ethical treatment of others. So for me, I think that was, that was a profoundly moving um, experience. Um, okay. What does a Ukraine win? A Russian, so I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to answer this. We'll try. <laughs> um, as I said, we're not foreign policy experts, but what does a Ukraine win and a Russian loss look like? If Russia loses, do you think Putin is over? And what will it take to get Putin out of power and held accountable by the International Court for War Crimes? In Yiddish, I'd say, ich weiß. Uh, I don't, <laughs> I'm not, that means I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but maybe, Marguerite, do you, have a, do you have a comment on this question? Oh, well, I have an opinion. <laughs> I, I, can, if I, I, I know one thing. I heard President Zelensky say, God bless us for President Zelensky say I, um, that a victory would be for Russia to go back to the previous borders and to leave them alone. That's what I heard. For Russia, I have no idea what the victory would be because I think, I think that Putin wants to go all the way. He, I think he, he's just testing us with Ukraine because I did a program some years ago about Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan and Armenia, etc., and so forth. And uh, there were people living there, and they said he wants to get his oil to the sea. And Odessa's on the sea, right? Yeah. And um, victory for him, I think, would be if he could get a, an opening to the sea that way. I don't know, but that's uh, what I, I think. I Sorry, th I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. That's okay. I think for, for many of us, and again, this is not an expert opinion in any capacity, I think that the media landscape is uh, immensely confusing. I think you know we see this even in our own community. We have people who have friends who live in Russia, and the media consumption in Russia is markedly different than the media consumption in Ukraine. If you were to ask me uh, what surprised me about Poland, if you turn on the, the television in, um, in any of the Polish hotels that we were in, there's only one issue in Poland, which is the war in Ukraine. And there's a very clear narrative, even not speaking Polish, I can tell very clearly <laughs> what side of, uh, of the coin uh, Poland is on. But I think that people in Russia are 
in a very different media landscape and have a very different impression of, of Putin. So it's, it's hard to know, I think, what a win looks like. But as you were saying, Celia, I think that there's a hope that Ukraine can maintain a level of territorial integrity and that there's an opportunity yeah. for refugees to go home. I think those would be, um, those would be remarkable things. I have, uh, just quickly, I have um, three relations in, in um, Russia. Uh, one is in uh, Moscow, um, in their 40s, probably, very well educated. And uh, when the war broke out, they immediately cashed their rubles into American dollars and bought their one-way ticket to Israel. And on May April 3rd, they left. They left behind their homes, their jobs, um, their rentals, and their dacha. I have another cousin who is in St. Petersburg, and he's kind of very Russian and nationalistic. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's very difficult. The one who went to Israel is ashamed of being Russian. She's taking on that responsibility, and I guess it'll take some time. Um, and I'm glad you interrupted me because I was going to say something that was so totally not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep my, no, I'll keep it <laughs> to myself. So um, I'm curious, uh, maybe, um, actually, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'm going to answer my own question, which is I, I also want to share just today in the time that we have, there are remarkable opportunities if people are, are concerned locally. There are remarkable ways uh, that people can, can help to support Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees. And I want to make sure that in our time today we cover uh, some of those. Uh, there, there are Ukrainian churches, Ukrainian Catholic and Ukrainian Orthodox, uh, Ukrainian Catholic and Ukrainian Orthodox churches um, here in San Francisco that are collecting funds for Ukraine itself. Um, I think, as we mentioned, we're very fortunate that the, um, the Jewish community has been engaged, the Jewish Community Federation in San Francisco, uh, the neighbors here of the Commonwealth Club, um, have been raising funds, as has have many congregations for the Krakow JCC. Um, but one of the things that I, I'd recommend also, if people are in the East Bay, um, the Ukrainian community in the East Bay has been organizing itself uh, one of the most remarkably fun activities I've seen in a long time, which is they have the um, the Heather Farm Sunday Bake Sale. And if you're if you're in Contra Costa County on Sunday mornings. Uh, they're there from nine to three, but you have to really get there at nine if you want the good things. That's <laughs> your inside your inside tip. And I, you know, for me, as I said, my family um, comes from Ukraine, and there's this very strong overlap between uh, Jewish food and Ukrainian food. So if you want good blintzes and things like that, but get there before nine to Heather Farms to, um, to support that community. They're raising tremendous amounts of funds for Ukraine every day, every week, yeah. I wanted to say that last night the Contra Costa Interfaith Council and I think the either the Seventh-day Adventists or the Latter-day Saints uh, had a wonderful concert and the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas is the director, um, does wonderful work for Ukraine. So they will give you a list of places where you can contribute or help and um, yeah, thanks. I'm going to give now our, our panelists just a minute or two each for final thoughts, and I'm going to offer a final thought. So, yeah. uh, Marguerite, maybe I'll start with you. <laughs> um, you know, when I um, started to fundraise for Ukraine February 24th, it, it never occurred to me it would evolve to this. And my history has been to always work with refugees. And for the last four years, I've been helping um, relocate um, Afghan refugees. So it, it was just very natural for me to do this. Um, it's an incredible, an incredible uh, amount of work that we need to do to help the women and the children who are now refugees and who um, are lost. They just don't know what is ahead f for them and what is ahead for them with their country. And so I, I would ask each and every one, you know, whatever it is that you can do to help alleviate, make their life just a little bit nicer, just a little bit easier, it, it would be a blessing. Thank you. Celia? Wow. We still have five minutes. 
I really don't know where to begin, but I think the most important thing is we mustn't forget the other countries in the world where there's crises. They're all over the world, and our media, you're speaking of media, as you did, um, seems to co cover, cover one like boom, s cover everything. Everyone's talking about this particular thing, and then the next day there's another country and the, uh, the next particular, th you know. It just seems to me that we, we're forgetful. So as um, Marguerite said, I really do think we need to help everybody. The interfaith councils are a great thing. We have a guest here, Atta Argandawal, who started a group to help Afghan refugees and uh, that are here. And he told me that the Taliban are now making women wear and not go out at all, and, and people are being sh murdered. I mean, what would I say? I pray to God ev twice a day <laughs> that uh, Ukraine will survive, that we'll have peace in our world, that um, um, I, don't, I really don't know. But and Putin goes away. Well, Putin's another <laughs> subject. I overlooked Putin, but get the book, um, or if you can, uh, it's on Amazon, I believe, First Person. And it's, it says it's by him, but it really isn't. But he, it was his life until 20, no, 2000, the year 2000. And there's, you'll understand him a little bit better, but he's a tyrant, what could yeah. I believe. Thank you. And, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll share just a final thought myself as well. Um, For me, the experience of going to Poland, I think, as I said, I, I felt called as an American Jew, uh, as somebody with ancestry from Ukraine, um, to, to try to do something small in some small way to call attention to this issue and to support people who are experiencing profound need. Um, as Marguerite said, that act of witnessing for me, I think, was transformative in two really critical ways. First of all, I think that that experience for me, and I'm embarrassed to say, made it real in a way that, as I said, headlines don't. But I think more than that, the questions that people raised about why this group of refugees, why not the refugees from Belarus, why not refugees from Syria, why not refugees from Afghanistan, right? And so there's a sense of urgency about the condition of the world that seeing this type of stuff in person can raise uh, for all of us, and it gives us a sense of responsibility. Um, I, I always say, I always try to end a program like this with a sense of gratitude, because I'm so grateful for the blessings in my life, the blessings of family, community, uh, health, physical sustenance. But that sense of gratitude also, for me, is meant to cultivate a sense of responsibility. And so I'm grateful that I had this opportunity I'm grateful this opportunity also rose for me a new sense of urgency, not just in helping refugees from Ukraine, but really doing what we can in our own small individual ways to make a difference, whether it's making a small contribution, making a, a, a cake to sell at a bake sale, being an engaged citizen, or, or the work that folks do here at the Commonwealth Club to raise up critical, important issues and make sure they stay at the forefront of our consciousness. Um, so I want to thank, again, um, Margalit Year, Chair of CBS's Tikkun Congregation B'nai Shalom's Co-Chair of Congregation B'nai Shalom's uh, Tikkun Olam Committee, our committee dedicated to repairing the world the ways we can, and to thank Celia Menchel for uh, organizing today's program and for being a panelist today and for her great work here at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, I want to thank the club staff and our audience. Um, this has been a Commonwealth Club program called Ukraine Patriotism, Putin's Brutality, and World Empathy. It was coordinated by the club's member-led Middle East Forum. Now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating over 18 years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.